After years of hard work, the Soviets managed to finally perfect an innovative aircraft that could hover like a helicopter and fly like a fighter jet. From the start of the Cold War, they had strived to take the leading edge in military technology, and with the help of renowned aeronautical engineer Alexander Yakovlev and the impressive Yak-141, they almost did. The remarkable machine boasted four prototypes and broke several world records, but the fall of the Soviet Union cast a spell over its potential use. In a twist of fate, it would be the Russians' most loathed enemy that would eventually benefit from their own notorious technology. The next step. For decades, vertical takeoff and landing flight of fixed-wing aircraft troubled aeronautical engineers, as the military applications of such versatile machines promised a myriad of new opportunities. At the peak of the Cold War in the 1960s, several models and sketches were fashioned, of which the most famous was arguably the British Harrier, both in its land-based and navalized forms. On its part, the Soviet Union created the Yakovlev Yak-36 freehand, and four prototypes propelled the Soviets' engineering forward. The Yak-38 Forger eventually entered production and served with the Soviet Navy with over 200 examples. Nevertheless, the model was limited in its ordnance-carrying capabilities, not to mention overall performance. In truth, the Yakovlev aircraft designer and manufacturer always considered the Yak-38 an interim aircraft, or a mere step in the development of an actual military VTOL aircraft. Even before its creation, the Soviet Navy had explicitly requested a piece of machinery more capable than the eventual Yak-38. Still, the Navy issued a contract to Yakovlev in 1975, demanding an aircraft with a single mission, air defense for its fleet. The new model had to expand the capabilities of the Yak-38, and unlike its predecessor, sustain supersonic speed. Moreover, it was expected that its deployment would be similar to frontline fighters in terms of maneuverability, agility, radar, and weapons loads, as well as ranged interception. A new program was thus born, under the designation Product 48. Soviet aeronautical engineer Alexander Yakovlev was especially concerned about the project because of its importance and complexity. Thus, he assigned a significant portion of his Experimental Design Bureau, or OKB, to the development of the new aircraft. For the Navy, it would be the beginning of a new era of fighter aircraft, but for Yakovlev, it was an opportunity to design fighter aircraft again. No less than ten chief engineers worked simultaneously on the project that the military secretly called Yak-41. Over fifty different designs were considered, but many displayed incompatible engine arrangements and considerations. Most importantly, the challenge lay in providing supersonic performance and managing to keep a vectored thrust capability simultaneously. As a result, engineers adopted a single engine layout, both safe and simple. With a key necessity for an afterburner, twin-engine designs were abandoned, as an engine lost during landing would cause an immediate roll to the side. Hence, a single vectoring nozzle behind the center of gravity was settled as the best possible arrangement. In addition, dedicated vertical thrust jets were positioned behind the cockpit, and general forward thrust and lifting were provided by a jet pipe at the rear designed to turn down to 90 degrees to provide extra support for VTOL maneuvers. Notably, that same arrangement can be found in modern American F-35s. Configuration The Soviet engineers developed an airframe around the single-engine concept, and considerable time was spent on the development of another characteristic feature, the flat, rectangular nozzle. The design proved adaptable to the drastic changes in the configurations required for thrust vectoring and supersonic flight, and it also allowed for a thin and shallow tail. However, a circular nozzle was employed in the end. It was fitted in between twin booms, which in turn supported the distinctive twin fin tail, straddling both sides of the engine installation. The remaining sections of the Yak-41 mimicked previous design lines of Soviet high-speed aircraft, such as Mikoyan Gryevich MiG-25s and MiG-31s. Its airframe featured a slab-sided forward fuselage with rectangular intakes at both sides of the cockpit, and its small area wings were clipped at the ends, and profiled a marked sweep along their leading edges. Furthermore, the wings could be folded to aid in carrier storage. Likewise, the undercarriage was retractable on top of being reinforced and equipped with multi-disc anti-skid brakes. A steerable nose wheel retracted to the rear while the tricycle main gear retracted forward. Meanwhile, excessive heat from the engines emitted during landing was expected to damage the fuselage, 
so key parts were manufactured in titanium, and non-critical ones were completed with composites or graphite. What's more, hovering time was limited to two and a half minutes to avoid overheating. Ultimately, the design included a three-engine layout controlled by an interlinked digital system, which could in turn control engine startup as well as modulate thrust during vertical flight. Eight spring-operated dorsal flaps provided the engines with air, while the exhaust exited downwards towards the belly and out through an opening covered by two ventral doors. The primary forward thrust and lift unit was a Soyuz R79B300 turbofan engine, capable of 24,300 pound force on dry thrust and 34,170 pound force with an afterburner, while the lift engines were RKBM RD41 turbojets, which provided 9,300 pound force of thrust each. In addition, twin tandem reaction control jets were fitted at the wingtips, and a swiveling yaw jet was placed under the nose. As for the cockpit, it was pressurized and air-conditioned. The canopy was bulletproof at the front, and although it hinged to the right, a long dorsal spine blocked the rear vision. The seat was installed with automatic ejection in case the engine duct rotated past 30 degrees with an airspeed lower than 186 miles per hour. Impressive Potential the Yak-41 prototypes were equipped with simple instrumentation, very similar to the previous Yak-36M. Nevertheless, production aircraft would have featured an extensive avionics and weapons suite, with Doppler radar and laser TV ranging and aiming. Moreover, a heads-up malfunction display, or HUD, would be connected to a helmet-mounted missile aiming system similar to the MiG-29. Such a system would have allowed pilots to lock on to enemy aircraft by turning their heads up to 80 degrees from the front. Being a combat aircraft, production-quality Yak-41 models were slated to carry a 30mm GSH-301 internal cannon for close work, fed by a 120-round cassette. For external storage, five hardpoints were included, two under each wing and another on the center line. They would carry air-to-air -air missiles of up to 5,735 pounds in total in different combinations of short, medium, and long-range projectiles. Yakovlev was able to fund four prototypes, the first of which was known as 48-0 and was a bare airframe for routine static and fatigue testing with no call sign. The second model, 48-1, was a non-flying testbed with call sign 48. Only the final two prototypes, 48-2 and 48-3, with call signs 75 and 77, would be flight tested. Furthermore, only the airworthy models would be painted all gray with a black ray dome and fin cap antennas. The series' first flight happened on March 9, 1987, with 48-2, and its first hover was successfully attempted two years later, on December 29, 1989, with 48-3. Then, on June 13, 1990, the last prototype achieved the first complete transition from vertical to high-speed flight to vertical landing. And finally, the first vertical carrier-based landing was accomplished on September 26, 1991, aboard Admiral Gorshkov. During the testing phase, the aircraft was considered in excellent shape regarding combat maneuvers. What's more, test pilot Zenitsyn set a dozen world records using the Yak-41. However, such designation was still top secret at the time, so the model became known as the Yak-141 in the West. Thereafter, NATO designated the aircraft the codename Freestyle. Change of Plans The Yak-141 was an impressive aircraft for its time, with a maximum speed of Mach 1.4, or about 1,120 miles per hour. Its ferry range was 1,865 miles, and its service range was 1,300 miles. Its service ceiling rose to well above 50,000 feet, while its rate of climb was 48,215 feet per minute. Besides exhibiting strong qualities, pilots described a highly responsive aircraft with an outstanding fighter-like performance. Unfortunately, an incident on October 5, 1991, extensively damaged one of the prototypes. After a hard landing, the aircraft ruptured a fuel tank and ignited a fire. The pilot ejected from the cockpit after 30 seconds and was safely rescued from the sea. The aircraft required extensive repairs, so it was eventually put on display and never flew again. Later that same month, the Soviet Navy announced that there were no more funds to continue with the program. It was only a couple of months before the USSR fell, and serious rearrangements were taking place. The acclaimed model had been expected to enter production as Yak-41M, but was never delivered. In addition, plans to have improved avionics and leading-edge route extensions, or LERXs, at the wings were never brought along. 
Furthermore, an alternatively engined version called the Yak-43 also fell through, as did Yak-41U, a two-seat trainer that could have helped progress VTOL flight and inexperienced pilots. After announcing its inability to continue with the project, Yakovlev reached out to international partners in hopes of getting more resources to carry on. The American Lockheed Corporation, which was managing the development of their own F-35 Lightning II, took on the Enterprise. Though the partnership started in 1991, Yakovlev did not make it public until a year later, and Lockheed in 1994. Prototype 48-2 was displayed at the Farnborough Air Show in September of 1992, and the then two prototype series had a last exhibition at the Moscow Air Show in 1993. Despite its potential and high expectations, the promising machine never took part in the Russian Navy. Thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels for more content about the World Wars. And don't forget to leave a comment below and hit the notification icon. Stay tuned.